Order, I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank the witnesses for being here. Whether it is competition or outright conflict, our strategic interests will depend on our ability to move and sustain people and platforms around the globe. Force projection is only possible because of the sea, airlift, and refueling operations carried out by Transportation Command, Transcom, with support from the MARAD, uh, the Maritime Administration. Transcom and MARAD support the full range of military operations, including everything from humanitarian aids to operations like those underway in the Red Sea. However, we cannot take our logistics capabilities for granted. We must be prepared to meet the logistic demands of a conflict against peer competitors halfway around the world. The tyranny of distance will strain our logistics capability and we must make decisions now to meet our operational requirements for the future. The committee has legislated several key efforts that bolster our lift capability and prevent potential backsliding. For example, Congress required a minimum of 275 in inter theater aircraft to ensure we can meet our needs for long range air cloud. For he heavier lift, we rely on commercial vehicles supported by the Maritime Security Program, as well as an increasing aging reserve fleet to move mountains of iron and material. Sea lift recapitalization is a priority, but we need to go about it the right way. General Van Ovos, in your prepared testimony, you state that the purchase of used sea lift vehicles is complementary to an effort to build new sea lift vessels. We have the congressional intent reversed. Used purchase authority should be complement a new build effort. Unfortunately, years of collective feet dragging has brought us to where we are now. I agree we need to recapitalize the sea lift fleet, but there must be a dose of reality in the cost and availability of foreign built 15 year old ships that need hardened decks and retrofit after the fact. The results of the market assessment required in last year's NDA will hopefully be informative. I thank our witnesses for being here today and I look forward to your testimony. I'm joined by my colleagues, Ranking Member Joe Courtney, Chairman Waltz and Ranking Member Garamendi today. I want to thank them for their partnership and continued leadership on these important issues before our subcommittee. And with that, I recognize Ranking Member Courtney. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Kelly, and thank you to the witnesses. Again, time is going to be tight with votes coming up, so I'll try and just uh, truncate my remarks. But I just want to really uh, footstop what Trent um, said that, um, you know, sometimes our committee, it seems like our focus is on, you know, big Navy and uh, Air Force in terms of some of these programs. But um, I, I think I speak for both of us and really most of the committee that your um, departments uh, we view as uh, on par at least uh, in terms of the, the um, you know, times that we're living in right now in terms of the missions that you both have. And I am proud that our subcommittee has over the last few years working in a bipartisan uh, manner actually um, plussed up capabilities and the capacity of our mobility uh, enterprise. Again, we did not wait to um, sort of receive um, ideas or, or budgets. I mean, we, we took I think uh, the initiative, which we're, we should under the Constitution, to, to really um, you know, move these, these uh, critical uh, programs forward. So we established the Tanker Security Program, the National Security Multi-Mission Vessel Program, and authorized, uh, as Trent just said, a domestic new build sea lift program for 10 vessels built here in the U.S. And in the FY24 budget that was just signed by the President a few weeks ago, uh, again, our subcommittee led the way to secure $12 million from MARAD to carry out design of a new build sea lift program using the vessel construction manager contracting model, which I think we've actually finally reached some consensus that this is the way that we can efficiently and affordably, you know, really uh, grow uh, the fleet. Again, like Trent, I have lots of questions about, um, you know, whether we should be expanding the um, the purchase of used uh, uh, vessels. Uh, I just had a meeting uh, actually not too long ago today uh, where because of what's happening in the Gulf of Aden, the, the, the cost of buying uh, in the used market has, if anything, gone up because the um, willingness to part with uh, vessels is actually contracting. And that just, again, just is going to have an impact in terms of cost. So, um, uh, again, really, again, thank the witnesses to have the greatest respect for the great work that you're doing in all the different theaters that Trent said, and look forward to a good hearing. With that, I yield back. And I now recognize Chairman Waltz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I echo uh, both of, uh, of your remarks, and I think as we all know uh, and have discussed that uh, with China as the greatest threat this country has ever faced, uh, the 
tyranny of distance will strain everything. Platform, people, material, fuel, uh, logistics, win or lose wars. Uh, and I pray uh, that with a strong logistics footprint in place, a capable sea lift, capable airlift capability that the Chinese Communist Party, every time um, they see that, that will be a powerful, powerful deterrent. We know the closure of Red Hill is in uh, Hawaii is well underway. Defueling is now complete. It's been a, a couple of years since Congress has designated Transcom as the executive agent for bulk fuel management uh, in the FY22 NDAA. I'm interested in how Transcom has embraced that mission, this responsibility, uh, and what you're doing to support strategic operations, uh, especially in Indo-PACOM. We are in a race against time. I uh, am also, as you know, uh, General Van Ovost, uh, keenly interested in the oversight of the global household goods contract. The least we can do after our, uh, our service members come home is make sure their moves uh, happen seamlessly and that their families are taken care of, particularly in the recruiting and retention crisis uh, that we're now in. And I, I do expect, as you know, and I appreciate your engagement, uh, for you to work with the prime vendor uh, to make sure that we avoid any missteps, but that we have uh, a single point of failure now uh, for a key element of, for military families. And then I agree with, uh, with, Chairman, uh, uh, with Chairman Kelly that recapitalization of our sea lift fleet that we absolutely rely on uh, to move the Army, uh, all ground platforms, and material into theater is a pressing issue. Crewing these issues is a huge concern. We have a significant shortage of credentialed mariners uh, that Admiral Phillips and I uh, have talked about. That, combined with poor vessel states, poor maintenance, uh, uh, it's resulted in what I, I think we'd all agree is a less than impressive readiness rate uh, during recent exercises. Uh, we rely on all of this small pool, the same pool of credentialed mariners to crew commercial vessels in the maritime security program and the taker security program, and we have a tough road ahead. Uh, in closing, our ability to execute logistics in a contested environment, which we have not done as a nation in a very long time, will define our ability to succeed or fail uh, in this strategic competition. Uh, I look forward to hearing whether the FY25 budget request meets uh, this task. I yield my remaining time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. And I now recognize Ranking Member Garamendi. Thank you, and it's, well, look who's here. General and Admiral, thank you so very much for uh, joining us today. Obviously a very, very important I want to start by thanking both of you uh, for your leadership. Uh, I'm proud to represent a district with some of our nation's most vital assets. It's the gateway to the Pacific. And we also have Mare Island and Motco and a few other uh, key assets in, our, uh, in my district uh, that are essential for our presence and activities in the Pacific. Uh, and General Van Oost, thank you for recognizing and providing in your testimony the critical importance of MOTCO. By the way, there's a hill overlooking MOTCO that's going to be developed. You may want to purchase an easement um, and prevent that development from going forward. Uh, let's talk about air mobility. I remain concerned with the low readiness levels of the air refueling fleets. This combined with the sunsetting of the KC-10 and the unresolved issues of the KC-46 increase the concerns. Uh, unfortunately, we continue to accept operational risk for the KC-46 program, notably, notably deficiencies that threaten the already low readiness levels of the airframes. Uh, Transcom, you're going to have to ensure that given the unresolved issues of the 46, we're not divesting at a rate in which exposes the U.S. to unacceptable air refueling risks. Speaking of unacceptable risk, our mobility fleets have been operating without connectivity for decades. We've talked about this. I guess people that don't fly in these planes really don't care much about it. 
But if you're in one of these airplanes, you basically don't know what's going on around you. And you are at great risk. And so it's just unacceptable. A minimum investment, and I draw this to the attention of my colleagues here, um, a minimal investment in these transport uh, platforms can significantly increase the ability of that platform to survive in a contested environment and also be far more efficient in its operations. Maritime, thank Mr. Waltz for, and, uh, for raising it, as have two of my colle other colleagues here. Um, we've got to deal with this issue. And I know, uh, Admiral Phillips, you've worked at this for some time. We're going to buy used ships. We're 25 years old and spend a whole lot of money refurbishing them perhaps sufficiently, and they're going to age out very, very quickly. We're going to need a different strategy here. Some of this has been talked. I know Mr. Waltz and I have talked about a national maritime strategy in which we would use uh, Jones Act vessels and other uh, vessels that are in the American maritime trade, that they would be available, made to be militarily useful, and then call them up when we need them, building a reserve fleet that's quite different than our current reserve fleets. Uh, I want to, uh, I'm going to continue to look at how this might be done. It does not require that the military own all the ships. It simply requires that the military make those ships that are privately owned militarily useful with an additional investment and probably some stipend to keep them available if and when needed. General Van Ost, I know you do this with airplanes. In fact, I think you took two of the planes I needed to fly back and forth nonstop from Sacramento. So you put me on a route through Chicago. I'll blame it on you. Um, so this is uh, part of what we need to do. The Ready Reserve Fleet, we've had this discussion about how we might be able to ha create a national maritime security program using the Jones Act fleet, using uh, the other privately owned vessels that are on the water. Um, my final point uh, deals with uh, Title 11 financing to support our um, shipyards to, uh, on the private side, big issues on the government-owned shipyards. We could talk about that ad nauseum. But on the privately owned side, um, we need to, if we are building ships, we will, in the commercial or the private side, we will invariably improve our shipyards and the capacity for those shipyards to repair government ships and other ships that are necessary uh, in the face of a conflict. Um, we've enacted legislation to reaffirm MARAD's, Mar MARAD's authority to uh, determine cargo preference. We want that to uh, be effectively put in place. We want to make sure that if there's cargo, cargo is king, I'm told. Military cargo is critically important. So let's support our maritime industry by, use, by making sure that what is in the new law uh, is actually engaged. A lot of other things to talk about. The fact that both of you are here, I want to thank the chairman of the committees. You've done something unique, which I have. Oh, I should have expected you would do it, but I hadn't. But you brought, us, you brought together two of the key critical players in one hearing. Thank you for doing so. With that, I yield back. Thank you. And before I start, we're going to put us on the clock uh, so that we give everybody a chance because we've got votes. But General Van Ovos, I would go. Uh, I, I need to make sure. Hopefully, this is not your last posture hearing, but I think that it may be. And if it is, thank you for your tremendous service to our nation. And thank you also, Admiral Phillips. Uh, my first question is uh, General Van Ovo's. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm getting ahead. I still mean that, though. So if y'all can, okay, you're recognized. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Kelly, Chairman Waltz, Ranking Member Courtney, Ranking Member Garamundi, distinguished members of the committees, good afternoon. It's my honor to join you today with my senior enlisted leader, Chief Master Sergeant Brian Krizelnik, to represent the men and women of United States Transportation Command as we defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. 
I'm extremely proud of our team of logistics professionals who lead the joint deployment and distribution enterprise, continually exceed expectations, and ensure hope, deterrence, and victory are assured as we contribute to our nation's defense. From competition to crisis, the entire enterprise proudly delivers for our nation, allies, and partners. And we know our success around the globe would not be possible without the steadfast support of this committee and the whole of Congress. The fiscal year 25 budget request continues to make strides in closing gaps in our mobility areas as we prepare for global operations in a contested environment. A contested environment is the reality of today. Whether it's in the homeland or abroad, we cannot presume freedom of maneuver to execute operations with full access to our lines of communication. Our organic fleets, coupled with the vital capacity provided by our commercial transportation partners, must continue to present credible capacity, meaning we must modernize our mobility capabilities to include cyber resiliency and digital modernization initiatives. A connected, aware, and survivable mobility fleet and network is needed to maintain our advantage against a capable and determined near-peer adversary. My top readiness concerns remain sea lift and air refueling, Sealift is the backbone of our ability to deliver a decisive joint force. However, the age of the fleet is dragging readiness rates to alarming levels. 17 of the 47 organic ready reserve force ships are 50 years or older. To address readiness and the decrease in capacity due to the planned retirements of 27 ships in the next eight years, we must add younger ships to the fleet. Transcom supports the Navy's strategy to acquire UC lift vessels from the commercial market and further request to provide the Secretary of Defense discretionary authority to purchase foreign-built used ships under favorable market conditions without restrictions. We acknowledge Congress's intent to include domestic new-build sea lift ships to recapitalize the Ready Reserve Force, and we're working with the Navy and the Maritime Administration to create an acquisition strategy for new construction that will complement the by-use program. Admiral Phillips and I recently toured the Philadelphia shipyard and saw shipbuilding capacity available there. I believe the vessel construction manager model is a viable option for future sea lift construction program. I greatly appreciate your support for timely, predictable, and stabilized funding to meet our sea lift recapitalization requirements. Similarly, air refueling is foundational to our nation's power projection advantage. It is our most stressed capability. We must ensure continuous modernization and recapitalization of the aging fleet to meet the operational requirements of the modern battle space. Transcom supports the Air Force strategy for uninterrupted tanker recapitalization and accelerated fielding of the next generation air refueling system. Over the past year, we have made great strides diversifying our bulk fuel distribution and delivery posture by having an increased forward presence with fuel afloat in contracted maritime tankers and increasing capacity and access to the U.S. flagged maritime tanker fleet through the Tanker Security Program. In addition, we fully support the Maritime Security Program, Jones Act, and cargo preference laws that all work to ensure we have the necessary U.S. flag capability and U.S. merchant mariners ready to move sensitive defense materials during a national emergency. Maritime stakeholders have been experiencing challenges with recruiting and retaining qualified mariners, and we support MARAD and industry efforts to identify strategies that address the mariner shortage and ensure their readiness. To effectively sense adversary threats and activities in our logistics networks, both home and abroad, the nation must utilize all available resources. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act provides me insights into adversaries' intents, capabilities, and activities to contest our logistics capabilities. The loss of this authority adds risk to my mission. Additionally, passing a National Defense Supplemental is vital for the health of the Transportation Working Capital Fund, which preserves essential readiness and ensures response options for the Secretary of Defense. I'm honored to join Rural Admiral Ann Phillips. The relationship between Transcom and Merit has never been stronger as we work together to strengthen our national security. Thanks you once again for your leadership and the support you provide our workforce. I look forward to your questions. Admiral Administrator Phillips, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Chairman Waltz and Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member Garamendi and Ranking Member Courtney and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your tremendous support for the Maritime Administration, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and the U.S. Maritime Industry. Before I go further, allow me to express our condolences on behalf of the Department of Transportation to the families of those who lost their lives earlier this month when the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed in Baltimore. 
Events like this highlight how important our maritime transportation system is to our nation's national and economic security. MARAD's mission is to foster, promote, and develop the maritime industry of the United States to meet the nation's economic and security needs. In that context, the President's FY 2025 budget request of $859.7 million for MARAD will enable the agency to continue to strengthen our sea lift enterprise by advancing recapitalization of the Ready Reserve Force and vital commercial sea lift programs that support U.S. flag vessels operating in foreign trade. Let me begin by discussing our Ready Reserve, an area of focus today. Our 2025 budget requests $974 million from DOD Budgetary Authority for MARAD to acquire, upgrade, and maintain vessels in the NDRF and Ready Reserve Force. These funds help MARAD to keep the fleet in a ready, reliable, and responsive condition to ensure MARAD can meet the nation's strategic sea lift needs. The RRF consists of 48 vessels today, averaging over 45 years in age, and they are maintained in reduced operating status. This fleet will expand to 51 vessels by the end of FY 2025 with the planned transfer of vessels from the Military Sealift Command. MARAD is responsible for maintaining these aging ships as part of the Navy Sealift Recapitalization Plan. We are actively advancing urgent recapitalization of the RRF using congressional authority to purchase vessels through a contracted vessel acquisition manager. This approach successfully acquired two ships in FY 2022 and in FY 2023 purchased three more, one 10 years old and two 11 years old. The ongoing reflagging process following the stringent alternate compliance program will make all five vessels ready for use by the third quarter of 2024. We continue to collaborate with the vessel acquisition manager and have identified several potential ships for purchase with the goal of reaching the congressionally limited number of nine used vessels by the end of FY25. In the FY23 NDAA, Marid was directed to develop a sea lift ship design for the construction of 10 new vessels for the NDRF. I offer my thanks to Congress for appropriating $12 million in FY2024 funds to begin this vessel design. The 2025 budget also requests the full authorization level of $318 million for the Maritime Security Program to support 60 commercially viable, militarily useful vessels currently enrolled. We have also fully implemented the 10-vessel tanker security program and are requesting $60 million for the program. These ships will provide DOD with reliable access to product tankers supporting national economic security. One program participant withdrew after accepting a long-term U.S. government charter, and MARAD is actively working to fill the vacancy, and we expect to do so later this summer. We continue to work with the Center for Naval Analysis on the body of analysis that will support the maritime strategy, and we understand congressional interest in this important effort. We continue to collaborate as well with stakeholders to address the mariner shortage. We recently convened the FY 2024 Directed Maritime Workforce Working Group to identify number of the number of licensed and unlicensed mariners, recommended improvements in recruiting and detention, and evaluate how we can best recruit, train, and retain and reduce barriers to retention to grow our pool of merchant mariners. We also continue to expand Embark participation. Today, there are 21 commercial operators enrolled which operate over 180 vessels. We are working to develop a proposed Embark rule pursuant to the 2023 NDAA. In addition, the FY2025 budget request includes $191 million to support U.S. Merchant Marine Academy operations and our Capital Asset Management Program for USMMA. It also requests $87 million to support the six state maritime academies, including continuing to build out new training vessels. Four national security multi-mission vessels are under construction using the VCM process, with one delivered last fall, Empire State, the second, Patriot State, expected to be delivered later this summer, and State of Maine, just launched last Friday. The FY 2024 NDA doubles the student incentive payments program amounts from 32,000 to 64,000. This will offer more financial support for cadets in the strategic sea lift midshipman program at our SMAs. We thank Congress for this authorization. These programs reflect MARAD's priorities supported by the president's budget. We plan to keep you updated, of course, on our progress in these areas. We are honored to testify here today before you, again, with General Van Novos, and we look forward to questions you may have. Thank you. I thank you, and I'm going to be really strict on the clock today, guys, so uh, I may give you 10 seconds, but no more, and I will cut off answers, and with that, uh, if you'll put me on the clock. General Van Ovost, uh, how do you communicate the results of the mobility capability requirement study to the military services to inform shipbuilding, air refueling, and airlift procurements? Uh, thank you, Chairman. We use the Mobility Capability Requirements Study to, to provide our assessment of mobility sufficiency 
of the fleet. We work uh, very carefully with the services, OSD, and the joint staff. They're with us throughout the entire process, and we all brief the recommendations, and then that turns into the, uh, the budget process where we go after the gaps uh, to try to close them. And uh, Admiral Phillips, uh, what is your assessment of the interest in the tanker security program and ability to meet the authorized 20 ships, whether medium range tankers or otherwise? Thank you for that question, Chairman Kelly, sir. We uh, find that there is interest in the program. As I've said, we had 10 vessels enrolled. One had an option to, to leave for a long-term charter. Uh, we thank Congress for the $25 million to help us, uh, as, as we have discussed in the past, prepare for additional training opportunities to ensure we are able to man these vessels. And of course, it also depends on the ability of government cargoes to help assist and, and offset the cost of uh, managing a tanker uh, under the TSP program. Thank you. Thank you. And General Van Ovos, our air refueling fleet is comprised of mostly second generation aircraft who have to key to mic to receive threats. What is the way ahead on connecting the aircraft to information that makes them more survivable in a contested environment? Thank you. Uh, I say logistics is foundational to any strategy, and we have got to be able to move. Uh, our air refueling is foundational to the ability to project and sustain the joint force. Uh, we must ensure that they're connected and they have battle space awareness. And so I'm working with the United States Air Force to define those requirements for all of those uh, for uh, aircraft. It looks a lot like the types of capabilities we have in the KC-46 aircraft, which is sort of the future of air refueling. And, and do you have a, uh, a, an assessment of the cost of that? Uh, I do not have an assessment of the full cost, uh, uh, however the Air Force does. Okay, if you could, if you can provide that uh, just so that we have an assessment of that, I think that is very helpful for us to understand. And then General Van Ovos, uh, how is a contested environment expected to affect Transcom's ability to use the ready reserve force as well as commercial contract and logistics partners more, more broadly? The contested environment is going to require us to be able to communicate securely uh, with civilian and military assets uh, of the fleets. Uh, and, and therefore, we are working on installing secure communications uh, on the, the ready reserve force uh, 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 ships, as well as working with our commercial mariners, commercial shipping, to try to understand how we're going to get them information. We have been learning a lot with respect to the Red Sea as we are doing escort operations for U.S. flagged ships. Uh, and so we're taking those lessons learned and we'll be folding them into what we're doing in the Indo-Pacific for communications with them. And uh, I'm going to see some of my time back, but I want to thank both of you for being here today. I want to thank you for the visit in the office yesterday where we talked much more deeply. And with that being said, I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Courtney. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this is a question, uh, I guess, to both witnesses, which is that I think you know from our, your meetings with members um, and, you know, past hearings that this subcommittee is very focused on the availability of used CELA vessels on the global market. In fact, in last year's NDAA, we directed Transcom and Mayrad to conduct a market analysis to determine the availability of used CELA vessels that meet military requirements and can be purchased. So number one, where does that report stand? When, when are we going to see that? You'll be seeing that here by June. And um, in the meantime, obviously, you have a request for another round of uh, buying uh, used vessels. The um, Admiral uh, Phillips, I mean, in your testimony, you, you indicated that um, the government was able to purchase around for about $90 million, uh, a, a boat. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. And does that, but that doesn't represent the total cost because there's an additional cost to actually convert. Uh, that used vessel to meet your specifications? There is, yes, sir. And can you give us sort of a, you know, round, you know, some kind of estimate in terms of what that number looks like? I think I would take that question for the record, sir, to be absolutely certain that I give you a good idea, but it is uh, certainly on the order of between 10 and 20 million for the Jolly class vessels. And that, that again, I'll take it for the record so we give you an accurate Well, we, we do sort of need that number, and I appreciate you know, your willingness to, to share that with us. I mean, that we've heard 20 to 30 and from some other folks that have visited the office, uh, the, our offices. Um, uh, because again, just sort of going back to the, to the math uh, of last year's um, spending bill, in FY24, Congress appropriated the request 
of $142 million for two vessels, um, which again, if you, if you take 90 million and add the conversion costs on top of that, it just, it, it just seems like we're, we're going to have, you know, we're going to run into some um, problems in terms of being able to afford all that. And, um, you know, I, I guess that, that's sort of the, the thing that we struggle with, which is, um, you know, this, this at some point just becomes um, a cost and a risk and an aging uh, vessel that um, you just sort of wonder whether we're getting the best value. Um, so again, do you feel that you can use last year's uh, spending appropriation uh, to buy two vehicles and convert them? We do think that we, be, we will be able to buy two vessels with the appropriation that we have uh, and s start the conversion process and, and hopefully c complete it as well using those funds. Uh, but I would add that the key is newer vessels cost less money to convert. And when we buy older vessels, we find things that we didn't know were there. The alternative co compliance program is, is quite strict. And we find ourselves uh, uh, in a similar situation to where we find ourselves with the ready reserve sometimes chasing our tail, trying to catch up with things that uh, have been in existence for a very long time. And that adds to the cost. No, and I think that describes the dilemma well. Again, the, the, the problem is, is that we just don't know what's in the market from one day to the next in terms of whether older or newer um, are actually available there. So we did. Um, provide money for design of new sea lifts, as you point out. And, um, and as I mentioned, you know, it seems like the ve vessel contract manager, vessel acquisition manager model seems to be something that people um, are embracing. Uh, I think it was in both of your testimonies um, that's there. So if we were to give you the money for a new build sea lift program in this year's budget, could you put that into on contract in FY25? Sir, I think it would be a stretch to put it in a contract in FY25 without having 100% design at this point in time. We would have to have 100% design, and I would estimate roughly two years to be able to get it under contract, uh, because I, I don't want to overpromise something that I that I can't deliver. Okay. Again, um, it, it, that's helpful, and you know, it's a question that I think we're going to keep asking. <laughs> okay. With that, I yield back. I now recognize Chairman Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and forgive me trying to get a sign up here, but I think this visual is, is powerful. We're all aware of uh, Chinese Communist Party influence and how far uh, the People's Republic of China has come and its influence over shipbuilding, over shipping, the industry, maritime infrastructure. It's to the point where I think the, the People's Republic of China could exact economic warfare, economic coercion, on the high seas, even during peacetime. And when we see the PRC with 50% of the civilian global shipbuilding capacity, uh, that is incredibly concerning. And just so, by point of some numbers here, 7,000 Chinese flagged ocean going vessels compared to less than 200. 1,700 orders last year that the Chinese are gonna build less than five. People, the American people need to understand this. 600,000 workers, 1,500 ships, large ships they're going to build. We're going to build, Mr. Chairman, we're going to build 20. Um, so I think you are both aware of the recent petition filed by the administration advocating for an investigation into unfair and uncompetitive practices by the PRC in the maritime sector. Uh, behavior I believe that the CCP is doing as part of a long-term strategy to basically make it nearly impossible for the U.S. to build or operate ships that we need, uh, not only for economic vital uh, vitality, but for to support our warfighter. Uh, Admiral Phillips, I'm going to give you the floor on this. What policy decisions and resources does MARAD need from Congress to help the maritime sector rise above these challenges. This is, a, this is an all of society. This is steel, aluminum, shipyards, dry docks, workers, wrench turners. Uh, we've asked for a national maritime strategy. I, uh, my office and in, in concert with others, uh, uh, both the House and the Senate have, have issued our thoughts on it. Talk to me about how we get here as a nation and start digging ourselves out of this hole. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity. What we need is a clear signal 
from, from Congress that this is a serious issue, that you take it seriously, which I know you do, and, and that you are intent on finding solutions to move things forward. By that, I mean I will frame out. How about, if I can just interrupt you, how about if we gave you a separate budget line? Is that a clear signal? It is a clear signal, sir, and uh, of course appropriations would be required as well, but to put a fine point on it with the ready reserve, of you, as you have mentioned, in, at the end of 25, I have authority to buy four more ships and, and then I'm done. I have $12 million, which, for which we thank you, to do a design for a sealift vessel, but there's, we would need additional appropriations, authorizations, and capacity to move forward from there. Correct me if I'm wrong, in the first Gulf War, approximately, what was it, about 400 ships that took our, took our ground forces over, now you're sitting on 40 to 60? Uh, it, well, that also would have included, sir, uh, the commercial vessels that were right. available, but they were approaching 200 Ready Reserve Force vessels at that time. Okay, keep going, though. What do we need to do? What else? Clear signal. Yes, yeah, sir. A clear signal uh, with, with intent, intent to move forward to begin build programs for things that we need uh, nationally. And, and this could include not only building, but it, it could include programs that are similar to things that we've done before, where we have either uh, built and then leased, or leased and then we, pr we provided the leases as the U.S. government and industry built to meet those leases long term. It would be a 20 to 25 year commitment. Those are options or ideas for things that could be considered for the future. Uh, but what comes with that is, of course, a clear signal that we care about this and we're going to move forward, support from Congress to make that happen. That also, of course, impacts our ability to provide crews, too, because then the industry sees, aha, I have a future here, I have a way to move forward. Without that, we have the, uh, we have the fleet that we are authorized and appropriated to have using the cargo preference laws that we have and our, and our DOD cargo requirements over time, which is what largely supports what we have today. I think there's a, the, the Chinese Communist Party now has the largest navy in the world uh, because they have the largest civilian shipbuilding industry in the world. Uh, and those thousands of ships, every one of them can be a warship just like that. Uh, and I think we are, have talked about, we've talked about this sea lift recapitalization, this issue since I've been here. But Mr. Chairman, I think it's time both of these committees start moving out in support of Marin. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. I now recognize uh, Mr. Garamendi, Ranking Member Garamendi. Chairman Waltz is marching down a path that I have just given the rest of my time. <laughs> it's interesting to note that uh, those used ships that you're about to buy, uh, the owners of those ships will take that, was it $90 million, and then go buy a Chinese-built ship. And I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Walsh, how that fits into the concerns that you so adequately put forward. <laughs> Seems to me that we're headed down the wrong path. But there are strategies that we really can and should uh, put forward. Bottom line of this, until we uh, authorize and appropriate, we're not going to succeed. Now, there's some ways we can do this less expensively. I'd like to say on the cheap, but just less expensively. Um, for example, we're going to need a lot of oilers if we're going to have a problem in the Pacific. In fact, we need them today. Uh, the uh, John L. Lewis ship runs, what, just under a billion a copy? Is that about right? We're not going to build many of them. However, if we were to pass a piece of legislation that uh, Senator Wicker and I have put forward, which is called the uh, Energizing the American Shipbuilding Industry, uh, admirals and general, this is not for you, this is for my colleagues. Uh, if we were to do that and say that 10 percent of the export of petroleum products from the largest petroleum product export nation in the world, the United States, was on American-built ships, we would build probably 40 to 50 ships in the next decade to 15 years, energizing our shipbuilding industry. The cost to the government, not much. However, we would want to put in a small requirement that those ships be, the word you use, Mr. Waltz, militarily useful. Have a king post in the middle and some communication systems. We could do this by simply changing the law, which we once had. All of the oil from the North Slope 
in the original 50, 25 years was brought to the continental United States refineries on American-built ships. And then we allowed that to go offshore to other refineries over the years, and then we did away with the ships. And now we are where we are, energizing the American shipbuilding industry. Anybody from Mr. Wicker's state here? <laughs> um, there are ways we can do this. Jones Act. Allow and use the Jones Act military useful ships. Add maybe 10%. We'll subsidize that. We'll give a stipend as we do with the uh, craft program, the aircraft program. And we can then build a domestic fleet, same time rebuilding our shipyards. Um, geez, I'm supposed to ask a question to you, <laughs> to the witnesses. <laughs> Forgive me, members. Um, I don't know. You say you're agnostic. Uh, General Van Oost, you just need the ships. I don't like that reply. And you know why we've had this conversation. I want you to be an advocate for American ships. Uh, can you do that? I, I'm absolutely an advocate for American ships. And, and we owe you a comeback uh, with Merritt and the Navy to talk about a creative acquisition strategy uh, that's going to uh, support maritime nation writ large and be part of the, the national uh, uh, maritime strategy that Merritt's putting together. Thank you. Uh, I know that we, uh, we talked earlier about the, uh, the, my colleagues talked earlier about the, uh, the mariners themselves. <laughs> Obviously an ongoing problem, not only but across almost every part of our economy. Uh, it's about pay, it's about uh, knowledge, and it's also about, uh, in most of these cases, we have maritime unions, apprenticeship programs. There are apprenticeship programs in some of the more recent legislation. We ought to look at that, use that more robustly. With that, I'm going to yield back. Thank you so very much. Well, I think, and I will not disagree with Senator Wicker, and when he and Mr. Garamendi and I all agree on something, we're probably in the right space. <laughs> I now recognize uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, uh, it is remarkable that we get to agree together with uh, Congressman Garamundi and, uh, and General Kelly, and uh, it's wonderful to uh, agree also with uh, Senator Wicker. Uh, and uh, indeed, we support uh, bipartisan your efforts in every way. And uh, General Ovost, I want to thank you for your service to the nation and leadership at the United States Transportation Command and taking the opportunity to highlight uh, South Carolina uh, we are so grateful that the service members of the 437th Air Wing stationed at Joint Base Charleston from the Air Mobility Command under the, your command of TRANSCOM. The Joint Base Charleston is a great example of the joint readiness across the force, and it, this is due to the leadership within TRANSCOM uh, Enterprise. And I particularly appreciate it. My dad served in the Flying Tigers in World War II Army Air Corps. And uh, we used to go uh, visit the Charleston Air Base to see F-86s take off, uh, which we thought were very advanced at that time. And so, uh, again, your leadership is critical. In, in your statement, you sadly mentioned that 17 of the 47 ships in the Organic Ready Reserve Force are 50 years of age or older, with the oldest being 56 years uh, of age. This raises readiness concerns for the impact of that age and the life cycle for our uh, sea lift capacity. And that's why I'm so glad, as you clearly see, uh, you have the uh, bipartisan support, uh, even bicameral, and so of the House and Senate. With that in mind, for each of you, the Iranian-backed puppets, the Houthis, have continued their assault on the commercial and military vessels in the Red Sea, dis disrupting the free flow of commerce through transit routes. If events like this underscore the importance that the contingency plans and redundancy plans we have in the global supply chain with a direct challenge to our allies of Korea, Japan, India, Philippines, Australia. With that in mind, what is, with the ongoing events, uh, General and Admiral, the, and military exercise, what lessons learned have we captured to help improve in the areas that we have against such threats? Yeah, thanks, Congressman. I'll start with, uh, uh, we are very focused on 
uh, contested lines of communication, like things like choke points. Uh, and so we are working with commercial industry uh, to, to help them uh, communicate with us, to give them the intelligence. And in fact, you saw us do convoys uh, with our commercial partners uh, th through the Straits and, in, and into the Red Sea. So we're taking those lessons out to the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's a different category out there. The threat is much higher. Uh, so we're, we are also focused on training mariners about how to, uh, how to navigate in, in contested waters. Uh, we know that they will be with us. Uh, but it, it also, I think about, we are so dependent on our commercial transportation partners, we cannot uh, project and sustain the force without them. So we will absolutely take these contested logistics uh, ideas, we, and we are exercising them right now in the Indo-Pacific. And, and today, uh, it was really outstanding. Uh, we had uh, Prime Minister Fumio of uh, Japan speak, uh, and I hope everybody uh, saw his resolve. Uh, has stated his resolve to work with NATO, to work uh, very closely, uh, continue with the United States, uh, and how important it is that we be working together, and indeed with the Red Sea routes, and I, I know uh, Korea, too, uh, has been involved. Uh, General Van Obost, uh, would you assess the Middle East as being one of the most enduring security and stability challenges due to the numerous attacks on our infrastructure, uh, Iraq, Syria, and losing uh, three American service members in uh, Jordan uh, recently on January 28th, the horror of that. Uh, are there any further steps that Congress can do to better facilitate your efforts? Thank you. Our hearts go out uh, to the families of the fallen. Uh, when I think about the, the globe, though, I have to think about our pacing challenge is China. Uh, and an acute threat is Russia, as you don't know what's going on uh, there, with especially Russia and Ukraine, and the future of whether Ukraine stands or falls, which is dependent on a supplemental. Uh, and I'll let General Cavoli make that, make that statement, but it's critical, and we depend on a supplemental as well to continue going. There are enduring threats around the globe to include in the Middle East. We have great partners in the Middle East, uh, and I work very closely with Eric Carrilla to ensure that he has the transportation and logistics he needs to maintain deterrence in, in the Middle East. We want to thank both of you. Your service could not be more important as we have a war between dictators and democracy. I yield back. And we're sending every witness to the school you went to. You are succinct and you answer the questions. I now recognize the gentleman, uh, Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, both chairmen and ranking members for holding this meeting and certainly to our witnesses. Very much appreciate the time that we've had to discuss not only in the past, but today. Um, we've heard a lot about the capacity. Uh, Mr. Waltz in his chart up there showing what China is doing. And certainly China follows a rule that we don't. You don't see any of China's uh, naval vessels being made anywhere but China, and certainly to support boats. And our conversation, or the one that I would like to have today, talks about uh, our industrial base, uh, the ability for shipbuilding. Certainly, uh, sea power has been focused on it, and Joe Courtney and others. But uh, the uninterrupted recapitalization. So on one hand, we're having to go out to the used market to purchase ships because they're not available to us in the time factor and, and the cost that we need them. Yet we don't want to set up that recapitalization to build new from the get-go. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're not going to have the capacity until we make that decision collectively that we have to build this in America to build up that capacity because we talk about supply chain issues particularly came to light during the pandemic. Well, the most difficult part to get of any ship, of any airplane, of any vessel that might run on tracks is called the human capital and you don't grow it overnight it takes time and certainly um, it takes a lot of uh, pressure from us to say we need to build this how many times do they take an attack on the jones act so what i'm going to do is uh, the both of you went to the philly yard and talked about the construction management model and what we saw there virtually in naval terms, absolutely on time and under budget, in naval terms. But what they're doing there, and we can expand that model 
so that that self-fulfilling prophecy of not being able to have the capacity, you have to start somewhere. So Admiral, share with us a little bit what they're doing in Philadelphia under that construction management model and how we can take that and potentially expand it because they want the work. How can we give them the work they need and most importantly, have those vessels for what we need to defend America? Thank you, sir, for that question. Um, I would add that Philly isn't the only one that wants the work, uh, but certainly Philly has shown, Philadelphia has shown that the vessel construction manager program can work. Uh, the program it consists of us contracting with the vessel construction manager who then contracts with a yard to build uh, the vessel as designed. Uh, in this case, uh, I believe a lot of the success is attributed to having a strong vessel construction manager, first of all, but also starting with 100% design, with a firm fixed price contract, and a very small change order budget, and then using commercial best practices to oversee the design, build, and implementation of that build with the ship. So that is what has made the, the Philly ship NSMV program so successful, and I believe that can be replicated uh, in, in in many senses to facilitate additional ship construction programs, and it can be worked across many yards and many different vessel construction managers. We build those ships differently than we do our vessels that go to war. There's no question about that. Uh, but the 100% design or as close as we can get to it, and we've seen that change. One of the questions came up is, how can we send a clear message to you? Well, we did it last year in the NDAA. The modified by American provision for major acquisitions used to be in the 50s. We're going to move that up incrementally per year to send the signal to the industry we're going to buy from American, up to the 75%. That is the sort of signals we are sending. But if we don't exercise it on our end and your end to actually implement these, they're not going to get the right way. And I'm going to yield back my final 30 seconds. Thanks. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I have a little take than some of my some of the previous comments that have been made. Uh, I want the American citizens. Know we're not talking about aircraft carriers or destroyers when we're talking about the uh, the by used. If I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're typically talking about a roll on roll off ship, very similar to what we see. Um, and the pictures, unfortunately, of the bridge collapse. Is, is that correct when we're talking about these roll-on, roll-offs? Yes, sir, it is, essentially. The three most recent ships we bought were ROCON, so some container capacity, some roll-on, roll-off cap capacity. The two previous are ROROs. Mm -hmm. When is the last time that a roll-on, roll-off ship was built inside the United States of America? The last commercially built vessels that were built in this country, sir, um, for international trade, not Jones Act, international trade, were built in the 80s. In the we do 80s. have Jones Act construction now. Of, an example would be Matson and, and Peja, two West Coast carriers who build uh, container vessels, okay. and they build them in this country. So how many, how many of those container vessels have built, been built inside the United States in the last 10 years? I can't answer the last 10 years, sir. I know Patient just finished two vessels, and Matson has an order for three in Philly that will follow the NSMV program. And how long will it take to build those three? Several years, I would expect. Uh, this is an estimate, probably four years. Okay. My, 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 point, my point is that if we're going to deal with the capacity challenge that we have and the time that we have to deal with it, you have to accept that the calendar days and the time limit and the capacity is a problem. And, and I just, I think we should raise the nine ship limit. Uh, and, and if we get rid of a 50 year old ship and we, and we end up with a 15 or a 20 year old ship until we're able to get new ships built, uh, if something kicks off between now and then, then we're, we're better able to serve uh, this country. And, and, and so my question is, uh, you know, you've called for, um, General Van Ovis, the, the nine ship limit be removed. What if it's not removed? How long would it take if it's not removed for us to fill the capacity gap that we have? Uh, given the expected decommissioning of 
of 27 ships in the next eight years, uh, we will um, be at a much elevated risk to be able to meet our mission requirements, which is why we need to come back to you with a more comprehensive strategy that looks at the near term, the mid term, and the far term. And, and, the, the and that's my compilation. And so when we talk about the need to temporarily to raise the limit so that we're temporarily able to use ships not built in China, but built in Singapore, built in Japan, um, we're standing down how many ships over the next, give me that number again, what you just gave? 27, 56% of the fleet. Okay, so we're going to get rid of 50% of our transportation capacity over the next how many years? Eight. Over the next eight years. 2032. Okay, and it doesn't sound to me like in the last 30 years there have been that many ships built inside the United States in that category. It, it's simply, it's simply a, a question of do you want to have something to fill the gap until, until the U.S. manufacturers are able to fill this or not, when, when, if you ask me. So... Um, Real quick, General Van Ovis, we talked about the supplemental and the need for the supplemental for you. Can you talk to us just briefly about the $550 million, um, the specifics of that, just so that everybody, uh, I think the people on the committee understand, but just so the American citizens understand the need for the supplemental from the standpoint of Transportation Command. Yes, so from the standpoint of Transportation Command, $550 million are earmarked for transportation services. Uh, to account for the transportation uh, for the events after October 7th uh, in the Middle East. The, those transportation costs have not been recouped, we have not reimbursed, and that causes us to drain our funds uh, such that uh, we, if we have a, another emergency, we'd have to look to see where we'd have capability to provide options for the Secretary of Defense. So our transportation working capital fund is necessary. To pro it's really our readiness function for Transcom. And that money has already been spent because of what happened in Israel. Approximately $180 million has been spent so far, but we are forecasting up to 550 because we deployed forces and we'll have to bring them back in 2024. Thank both of you for your, your time and your service. Gentlemen's time's expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. DeLuzio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, Admiral, good to see you both. Uh, General Von Ovost, I'll, I'll start with you. I appreciate the uh, Transportation Command report uh, responding to a request I had made in the this past year's uh, NDAA, identifying vulnerabilities in transportation networks here in this country. Uh, personnel section under U.S. Transcom concerns regarding commercial railroad capabilities. Report states, and I'll, I'll read this brief passage, uh, over the past decade, the implementation of lean operational processes by the major railroads, common referred, commonly referred to as precision scheduled railroading, or PSR, has had impacts on the railroad labor force across almost all specialized trades. The railroads have reduced the number of employees. Although the intent of PSR is to improve the overall economic competitiveness and efficiency of rail operations, it has arguably sacrificed resiliency and the ability of the rail industry to effectively respond to changes." End quote. Uh, general, uh, the overall assessment in the report is that uh, essentially freight rail is adequate to meet the needs of your command. Um, although you identify that risk in the report, just give me a sense of those staffing issues and how they could raise concerns intermediate, longer term to the mission you have to accomplish. Certainly, I would say across the transportation industry, we are having, we are seeing labor shortages, and so railroad is no, is no exception to that. Uh, so as you have less crews, uh, you have less resiliency, could, it could occur uh, with delays, and so we're working very closely uh, with the railroad industry to have to have discussions about how do we ensure resiliency uh, across the networks. That said, uh, should we have an issue on a rail, we do have multiple ways uh, to perhaps offload the rail and go to, to trucking. So I work with Northcom with respect to uh, transportation, uh, making sure that it, it, uh, we have robust a way to defend uh, the transportation lines, and I work with the DOT to ensure we have multiple pathways to get our cargo where it needs to go. Very good, thank you, and I appreciate the department's uh, you know, announcement in the last few weeks of implementing two-person minimum staffing. I think will help with rail safety across the board as part of my Railway Safety Act in, in general. Um, Rail Admiral Phillips, your testimony last year at last year's posture hearing uh, mentions direction from Congress 
uh, from ARAD to develop a roll-on, roll-off ship design for construction. We've had a little bit of uh, dis discussion there. Give us a sense, where are things, what kind of updates do you have for us, if any? Thank you for that question, sir. Uh, we thank Congress this year for, uh, last year we didn't have any funding to do this. This year we do have funding to do this. The 2024 NDAA appropriated, uh, authorized 12 million, and we have an appropriation for 12 million to begin to develop this design. Very good. Uh, with that in mind, given the pace of things today and votes, I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Minnesota who has an accent, Mr. Finstad. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you both uh, for being here and, and for your service. Uh, many hardworking suppliers of several different transportation systems which fulfill missions and requirements for the three subordinate commands of U.S. Transportation Command live and work in southern Minnesota. The demand signals for the industrial base is critical to our national security, projecting power and investing in the defense workforce. It is these private sector workers and innovators that will build and sustain the mobility enterprise. Employees and independent contractors alike have a role to play in this most important work. So with that being said, and with the uh, acknowledgement of the time that we have here, General Van Ovost, I understand that U.S. Uh, Transcom favors moving away from the independent, independent contractors for, truck, for truckers that move freight and household goods. Do you think this is a wise move, and have you based this course of action on any underlying data, considering that a large portion of our trucking fleet is made up of independent contractors? Congressman, I wouldn't say we're walking away from independent contractors. In fact, if you um, provide quality move services, you're absolutely welcome and volunteer to join uh, the Home Safe Alliance. And again, it's a single move manager, uh, but we will have multiple uh, you know, sub companies up underneath. In fact, at least 40% uh, of the contractors up underneath Home Safe Alliance m must be you know, our, our smaller industry, small business owners. And so we are, we are keeping a close eye uh, to ensure that they meet that requirement. In fact, it is a performance parameter for them to meet. Great, well that, that's good to hear. I mean, it's obviously important for the folks that I represent. It's a, a great opportunity and, and partnership to really strengthen and send signals to the defense industrial base. And, and uh, I'm just happy to hear, hear your response. So with that, Mr. Chair, me and my funny accent will uh, yield back. I now recognize the gentlelady from Hawaii, Ms. Takuda. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and General. Thank you so much for, for your service. Um, General, um, your written testimony highlighted the fact that our forces are not ready, postured, or scaled to optimize limited strategic assets for global patient movement. I'm especially interested in the challenges of patient movement in a contested environment and in large-scale combat operations against a peer or near-peer adversary in the Indo-Pacific, my backyard. Uh, the fiscal year 2020 NDAA established a pilot program to enhance interoperability and surge capacity of the national uh, disaster medical system, which includes three main components, medical response, patient movement, and definitive care. Now, I believe it called for five pilot sites, none of which are in the Pacific region. That being said, General, would you please briefly discuss how Transcom works with and integrates the national disaster uh, medical system into your planning for global patient movement in a large-scale Pacific contingency? I'd like to first point out that our air medical evacuation personnel have performed brilliantly over the last few decades to save uh, our servicemen and women around the globe, and I'm immensely proud of what they do every day. That said, we are at risk uh, to meet the casual demand expected in a large-scale combat operation, especially in the waters of the Pacific. Uh, in fact, uh, we expect to have to move uh, the, uh, the amount of the entire patients we moved last year in one week in such an event. This is how we have to think about how we're gonna to have to change our, our concepts of operation and our, and our modes and, and actually how we deliver. When we think about people having to dwell in theater, how we have to partner more with our, with our allies and partners to provide medical capacity in theater and how do we make those routes streamline to get back to the United States. And when we get back to the United States, I work with US Northcom uh, to work with the NDMS to try to distribute those patients uh, at different centers. So um, again, this is an end-to-end -end discussion, but it's at the volume that we've just never seen. In fact, we really haven't seen, uh, if, if should we uh, uh, lose a ship, 
you know, mar mariners in the water, how we pluck them out of the water, and how we get them into the system. So we are really, this is going to be a whole of nation effort. So we mm -hmm. have to go to war. And we're absolutely going to be using um, all services and, and resources of our nation to deliver. Thank you. I know I'm running out of time, and, and I would just uh, You're not. Time. You've got an additional two minutes okay, because they, they didn't restart the clock, so you've got an additional two minutes to what's showing. That being said, I know that we do have to go to votes. I would suspect that if we are looking at some kind of large-scale um, disaster engagement casualties in the Pacific, Hawaii would play a critical role in supporting patient movement and care, especially as we get them towards the continent. Um, you know, what kind of challenges do you foresee with transportation infrastructure, both in Hawaii and in the Pacific, places like Guam, uh, in terms of our ability to conduct aeromedical evacuations? Also, one big problem that we face consistently in Hawaii, um, which will only get worse in the case of some kind of contingency, is having sufficient medical workforce, uh, equipment, supplies, facilities to be able to support health care needs. Is Transcom thinking through what kind of surge capacity for health care staff and facilities we need to be prepared for whether military or civilian to meet any kind of patient movement um, or care through the Indo-Pacific, through Hawaii, again, to the continent. Thank you. We are doing a lot of thinking about the entire network. Again, I'm responsible for the end-to-end -end movement uh, of, of, of patients around the globe. So we think we are rethinking, we are reposturing, where would we hold patients? Uh, where could we bring them to, for rehab? You know, a, a tripler would certainly be, you know, an option for that. And so as I work with Northcom and NDMS uh, on where we'd have to expand, we're, we're thinking again about new concepts uh, and new ways uh, to take care of them. So that, that would be necessarily the downstream work as we set requirements for different locations around the Pacific and in the United States. Thank you. And, and you know, um, I know there's, as I said, five pilot sites. Perhaps if there are an extension of our additional pilot sites, one in the Pacific would be a valuable one so that we can really start to look at what will be necessary for us to be able to prepare for any kind of conflict and um, mass casualties. Thank you, Chair. I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, during World War II, uh, for every uh, aircraft carrier that was built by the Japanese, we could build six. Unfortunately for us today, we're Japan, China is us, except their capacity is much even, it's even greater than what our, our advantage was in, uh, in World War II. Yeah, we, we must, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, we need to make shipbuilding a, a defense, a security priority. Uh, and it's not going to be done here. Whatever we do here is peanuts, to be honest with you, when you look at, you know, really what shipbuilding capacity is all about. And when we're talking about nine ships or 20 ships, that's nothing compared to the capacity that, uh, that China has. And so we need to play the game that China played. They played it very well. They subsidized their industry. They captured the market. Uh, the market now, the, the world is dependent on them. Uh, they've got all the capacity. Uh, and they did it probably not using what we call fair trade. They, they use their own. They subsidize their industries. And that's what they do, by the way. That's what they do for everything that they feel to be strategic. All those industries are strategic for them. They subsidize it, capture the market, and then they got it. And, uh, and so we've got to start playing some of that game, not just here in Hask, but uh, on a whole of government approach. And uh, that's my, my, uh, my comment for this. But uh, my, uh, my question is uh, uh, to you, Admiral Phillips, the Port of Baltimore is home port of part of the Military Sea Lift Command's National Defense Reserve Fleet. Uh, what is the assessment of their ability to respond with the tragedy at the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge where any of the vessels impact by, by this incident? Sir, thank you for that question. We maintain, typically we have six ships there. We have four in Port Baltimore right now. Two of the four are under maintenance. The other two would be full up rounds. They are unable to leave the port. I would add that we believe once the 35 foot channel is open, which we expect at the end of April, that they were all, they are all clear uh, should they be recalled. Uh, by the Department of Defense. Were you prepared uh, for the event like uh, what happened at that, at that bridge? And are there any contingency plans for, let's say, a black swan event or deliberate attack on our key infrastructure like bridges that would, could bottle up our, our fleet? So, sir, as you're aware, there are 48 total vessels in the Ready Reserve right now. So there are additional vessels stationed around the country with similar capacities that would be available. Uh, of course, a black swan event is uh, always a challenge to anticipate, but uh, we, that is exactly why we don't station them all together and we station them strategically around the nation. 
finally, for, for you, Admiral, I, I'd really be uh, interested in your, in your views on how we can build, we can restore ship, shipbuilding capacity here in the United States, and not on an incremental basis, somewhere to, uh, it really meets the, the uh, security needs of, uh, of this country. I, I really believe this is a critical piece of our security infrastructure, and that we've been asleep at the wheel, and, uh, and we don't have the capacity to respond like we used to, certainly don't have the capacity to respond to an adversary like China. We need to, this is gonna be a long-term thing. It's not gonna happen overnight. How can we get back to having at least the capacity that we need to maintain our freedoms here in the United States, and I appreciate that. And I'll yield back. Gentleman Neal's back. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, General, I wanted to ask uh, if you could talk a little bit about the V-22. I know that the uh, Pentagon has cleared it to fly again, and given the unique capabilities that the V-22 has, uh, particularly in rapid intra-theater transport, can you speak to how the V-22 uh, fits into operational strategy, particularly for missions that require both speed and versatility? Yeah, so I'd love to talk about the CV-22 as much as I love it. It's a great airplane. Uh, however, um, I would ask you to speak to, to the Navy and oh, yeah. SOCOM okay. about the airplanes. I don't, I don't uh, have them right. in my repertoire. Okay. And then I also wanted to ask you, um, I, and I talked with you about this before, I know that it's taken nearly six years from the initial announcement in 2018 to begin implementing the new military household uh, goods shipment system. And I wanted to ask you, um, uh, why are these specific 14 installations uh, uh, chosen for the initial rollout? Thanks. Uh, we were doing a conditions-based rollout, and we've started here in April. Uh, and we chose those locations because the services said that they were ready because this is not just a, a single contractor. We are changing the entire model. So we worked with the services to train them. Um, they came forward and said we're ready at these locations. Uh, and it made sense. These are local moves within 50 miles. Uh, and so as they, as they chose sort of the, the heat map of, of where the most moves would be and where they were the most ready, that's how we selected them. We, we do all of this in conjunction with the services. Okay. Uh, and, and what are the parameters for success in this initial phase? And based on the current schedule, uh, when do you foresee the new system being rolled out to encompass 99% of service members? Yes, so we are, uh, we are going to pause, uh, bring on new capability during the peak season uh, to reduce risk and really focus on customer experience. So the vast majority of this season will be done by under the old tender of service system. Uh, and uh, then we'll begin full domestic um, ramp up through the end of this year, about September through December. And then we all the way through to next year, we'll start doing uh, overseas moves beginning in September of 25 and then ramp up from there. Again, a deliberate conditions-based approach uh, to this capability. Uh, that said, uh, we have, you know, almost uh, 30 metrics that we watch. We gather data every day, do analysis weekly uh, on the metrics that they're going to be graded against. So immediately we'll be able to see if, if there are any concerns and provide immediate feedback. And that feedback is also available both to the services uh, and uh, to the company and sub and sub vendors. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask you also, um, how do you think the moves, if you if you look at the, the current experience versus the, 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 the new system that you wanna put in place for the military moving system, uh, what steps are being taken to ensure that, that the enhancements are going to be effective? Uh, absolutely. Look, the current tender of service program does not provide consistent, high-quality moving experience for our service members and their families, and it's difficult to hold uh, industry accountable for performance failures. So this complete change in how we're doing household goods as, as really mandated in 2018 by, by Congress, um, this is going to help us achieve a standardization and integration and capacity management that we can achieve today. Uh, accountability with defined standards, um, with trained personnel, uh, modern digital management tools where you could uh, do the move on your iPhone, enhanced communications, and simplified claims, again, that we, are, we do not have today. So given all of those changes, we think it's going to be a radically different experience. And, and speaking of the accountability that you just mentioned, how is this new system, uh, as far as service quality, 
uh, concerned? How is it going to handle potential issues that you hear from families dealing with loss, uh, damages uh, of people's belongings during the move? Yeah, we now have a 24-7 contact center and the quality assurance representatives that are at the locations that will visit on site are cleared to immediately make a call if there is a problem, uh, which then gets funneled to a center that's gonna take care of the problem right away. So we will know immediately if things start to go off the rails because we, what we really desire is that our service members and their families have, have a confident, pleasant, quality move no matter where they're moving. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman, to go back. Now recognize the gentleman from Guam, Mr. Moreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General. Thank you, Rear Admiral, for your testimony. And uh, General, I appreciate your visits to my office. It's been really helpful. And I truly support your objective to ensuring that we have the fleet that is necessary. Absolutely. And once we get those ships into especially the indo pacom area, we've got to get it loaded and un unloaded. And General, in our last meetings, we talked about the urgency of funding the Port Authority of Guam and its unique role for the Department of Defense. Can you please elaborate on the necessity of the Port Authority of Guam in U.S. Transcom operational structure and what infrastructure there is critical to your mission? Thank you. I, I tell you, uh, it's an understatement to say how important Guam is to our operations in the Pacific. So thank you for your leadership out there and thanks the committee for the support of uh, the infrastructure and resiliency work that we're doing uh, out there right now. Uh, so Guam is critical, uh, and uh, the, the Navy uh, port, seaport of, Navy seaport of Guam, um, is critical for us for a lot of our deployment requirements. Uh, and then the civilian side of the port has been important for our sustainment, uh, if you will, and, and construction materials, which are really critical, again, right now, as we are, we're bolstering our posture uh, and helping the services and our allies and partners uh, come out there and get settled in. Uh, so I think about uh, Guam all the time. In fact, there's a new two-star commander uh, that's going to roll out and be responsible for integrating all of those projects together. And I look forward to working with him or her uh, uh, on how do we help uh, to ensure that we can phase in and meet the requirements of the buildup there. Uh, thank you. And the new general is the one star that stepped up. Hoffman will continue on there with his family. So it's wonderful. Uh, along with that line, there's two pieces of infrastructure I'm concerned about and to include the Port of Guam's gantry train cranes, which are in need of replacement, and the harbor's breakwater, which reportedly one more typhoon could destroy. If these two pieces of infrastructure fail, the people of Guam could lose access to commercial shipping. Considering the approximately 40% of cargo moving through the Port of Guam is for the military. How is the Department of Defense uh, will be impacted by this infrastructure deterioration? Yeah, certainly we like resilient options uh, with respect to berthing and where the cranes are, uh, and, you know, the Navy port and, and the civilian side of the port. Now, as you know, uh, the Department of Defense does not, does not fund uh, the infrastructure on the civilian side. Uh, I turn to our Maritime Administration partners for opportunities for, uh, for loans uh, because essentially uh, we get billed to use those things and it's that money that goes back that, that, uh, that goes back to reinforce and reinvestment uh, supposedly by the, by the civilian contractor. So I, I defer to Admiral Phillips. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and Congressman, thank you. Uh, we have received letters from the governor on the topics you are mentioning exactly. Uh, and we have also been visited by uh, Gov Guam and Port of Guam staff many times. I see them often at AAPA and, and I thank them for their interest and their visits. Uh, as you're aware, we have a discretionary grant program, Port Infrastructure Development Program, that is an opportunity for Guam. They are a strategic port, so they are in a part of that process as well. And uh, as, as discussed, our gateway director, who is, is quite familiar with the staff at the Port of Guam, uh, has been in contact with them to help them work through opportunities to apply not only under PIDP, which I know you have done and, and done successfully in the past, but also to look at other grants within the Department of Transportation that may also facilitate the needs of Guam and particularly the port. I thank you for that and looking forward to that being completed. And final question is for you, Rear Admiral. Uh, the Maritime a security program helps America's shipping companies remain competitive in global markets and service routes to the Western Pacific, including Guam. Can you please outline how fully funding the maritime security program benefits America and the Pacific and supports our national security? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for that question. 
Uh, so MSP, uh, the Maritime Security Program, is, is fully funded at present under uh, current appropriations and authorizations, $318 million a year. That's also in the President's budget request. Uh, certainly having a full 60 ships ready uh, to support U.S. cargo movements around the world, and particularly in support of uh, DOD requirements and other cargo preference requirements, uh, is essential to us being able to move our cargo at the time and place of our choosing, and, and MSP in particular is a key element to that process, and, and we're very happy that we have 60 vessels in there now who are executing those missions. I thank you for that. Thank you for what you do. I'm looking forward to working with you to make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize our senior enlisted leaders and the hard work that they do as our battle buddies every day, uh, the aides, the civilian staff that work so tremendously. I thank both of our witnesses, no joke, for being the most succinct and accurate in answering the questions. And I know that doesn't come without the great staff that's behind you. With that, this hearing is adjourned.